In order to calculate or evaluate this particular integral, we utilize a trick, whereby we add and subtract f of a. f of a, of course, is a constant. It's simply the value of our function small f of z at the point z is equal to a. So, we begin with our original function. We add and subtract f of a, like this. Thereafter, we separate it out into two separate integrals, whereby we have f of z minus f of a on top divided by z minus a, and we have just simply f of a divided by z minus a. The point here is that f of a is simply a constant, and we've already basically seen this integral. Because above we had f of a equal to 1, and we saw that this integral turned out to be twice pi times i. Now because f of a is not 1, it, it, it's simply f of a, we're going to get twice pi i times f of a. This means that the integral on the right side is already calculated. We know the answer. Twice pi i times the value of the function small f evaluated at z is equal to a. Fortunately, unfortunately, this does not help us with the other integral here. What's the value of this? Now we're going to look at this particular integral here in greater detail. I'm going to call that i2. Notice, of course, that it is an analytic function at every point except z is equal to a. We're going to employ the principle of deformation. Imagine we are integrating along a path C1. We could imagine that we have a second path which is not C1, but is obtained from C1 by continuous deformation. Of course, the path C2 can't have any poles. So let's say we have a point here on the left side, Z0 and Z1, and we're trying to get from Z0 to Z1 by using the path C1. We could imagine an infinite number of other paths which are gotten from the path C1 by deforming it. You could imagine C2 or C3 or whatever. And the point here is that the principle of deformation allows us to essentially move or adjust our curve and still get the same answer. In practice, what happens is, let's imagine here we have two poles along this kind of rectangular uh, a rectangular integral here, C1. Of course, we don't want to integrate along our uh, poles because that's going to give us a divide by zero or an infinity. So what we can do is deform our curve C1 around the poles. Generally, what we do is we deform around the poles in a circular form and we continue from there. Now, if, if, you're, if it's very important to take into account the behavior of your function ac actually at the poles, we usually just take a limit as the radius of these particular circles extends to zero. Now that's something I don't want to get deep, in, deep into at the moment, but you can just imagine that we're able to deform our path to something else, provided the something else doesn't have any poles, and we're able to evaluate the new path. Where our curves or lines of integration include a pole, we deform the path around the pole in the shape of a circle or part of a circle. Where we want to include the poles, we then take the limit of the circles if the radius approaches zero. I've rewritten our integral i sub 2, which we're looking to calculate on the left side of your screen. This is a pole at z is equal to a. i2 is being integrated along the curve c in the domain d. So I've sketched that at the bottom of your screen. So let's say we have our arbitrary curve c here. C is inside the domain D, and it is going around the point Z is equal to A, where we have our uh, where we have our singularity or our pole. We invoke the principle of deformation, and we deform the curve C such that it becomes a circle surrounding the point where the pole is. It is it has a radius rho, and I'm going to call the circle capital R. So we go from having the circle, or excuse me, the contour C, to having the contour capital R, which has a radius of rho. 
Next, we consider the magnitude of the integrand. So the integrand here is what I was always describing as capital F of Z. So let's just look at its magnitude. Now, small f of z is analytic. I've said that from the start. Analytic and holomorphic are synonyms. They, they mean the same thing. Holomorphic is a more modern term for the word analytic. This means that the function f of z is continuous and is bounded. In other words, there is, there is, there is no infinity. Since the function is bounded, it must have a maximum value. What this means is as follows. We can define a value alpha and a value beta such that for all z in the magnitude of z minus a they're going to be less than beta in the domain. Therefore, the magnitude of the numerator which is f of z minus f of a is going to be less than alpha. Now that might seem a bit convoluted. We'll discuss it again now.